From a studio high above the clouds of the Okanagan Valley, this is the Cannabis Podcast. Exploring the world of Canadian cannabis culture, one toke at a time. Now, here's your host and bud tender, Gary Johnston. Now, in all honesty, I might have actually done more than one toke at a time in preparation for this episode, so I apologize for not sticking to the rules. Welcome to episode 13 of the Cannabis Podcast. If you have come back, I'm glad you did. And if this is your first time, I got a whole bunch of information for you, whether you are brand new to the cannabis world or you've been imbibing for a while like myself. This week, we have a little food talk, thanks to a story we found from our friends at OkanaganZ.com. We also stop at Cultivar Corner for another visit. This is the last of our Broken Coast selection with an indica-dominant hybrid called Gabriola. In fact, as you can probably tell, that may be the one or two more tokes that have been imbibed before the episode started. Feeling really good. We'll talk also about the long hoped for changes at the World Health Organization. They have finally changed or are rewriting their opinion of cannabis. Some details on that. A deeper look at another terpene and, yeah, I, there's a hint of perfume in the air. The terpene geraniol is what we'll be looking at. And I'm going to dig up another pre-legalization memory, getting busted, if you can believe it, for cannabis resin. Yes, it happened. That and more on episode 13 of the Cannabis Podcast. While Canada may be one of only two countries that have legalized cannabis, it's interesting that the entire world is watching. I found it very interesting this week to see the story about the World Health Organization finally realizing that they need to change their designation on cannabis. This is a story uh, that I pulled up from the jointblog.com, and the article's writer is Anthony Martinelli. World Health Organization Expert Committee Calls for Changes in Cannabis International Classification. Finally! <laughs> According to reporting in the British Medical Journal, the WHO policy reversal takes account of the growing evidence for the medical applications of the drug. And this marks the first time the agency has reviewed its stance on cannabis in, what's your guess, nearly 60 years. The recommended changes, outlined in a letter by WHO Director General Dr. Tetros Athanom Gebreasis and reported on by Normal, calls for cannabis to be removed from Schedule 4 of the 1961 Single Convention on Narcotic Drugs. Schedule 4 is the most restrictive classification under the treaty. So instead, the committee advises that whole plant cannabis and THC be designated as Schedule 1 controlled substances under international law. And the part that I found really interesting in this is that now in a separate recommendation, the committee has reiterated its 2017 request that preparations containing pure cannabidiol, CBD, and not more than 0.2% of Delta-9 tetrahydrocannabinol no longer be scheduled within the international drug conventions. So basically they're saying now if there is a cannabis plant that is predominantly CBD and very little THC, so 0.2% of it, they're taking that out and treating it completely different. The committee's policy recommendations now await action from the 53 participating member state of the United Nations Commission on Narcotics and Drugs. Interesting that in October, Normal delivered over 10,000 public comments to the U.S. Food and Drug Administration, urging that agency to recommend that the WHO reschedule cannabis internationally. I again have put the link in if you want to read this article for yourself. Interesting to see that the rest of the world is making some changes as well. I'd like to think that we might have sparked that ourselves here in Canada. Perhaps giving ourselves too much credit for that. The discussion was probably well underway as well. But anyways, the whole world is changing their opinion on cannabis, and we are leading the fight. THC, CBD, terpene profiles, what's in me? Oh, please explain to me. Go to the corner, go to the corner, oh yeah. Go to the corner, please explain this stuff to me. This week, our focus in Cultivar Corner is on another from Broken Coast, which we've had a lot of success with over the time that we've been doing this and the time that we've been buying legal cannabis. So Gabriola is the pick, and this is, by way of information, the most expensive we've had so far on Cultivar Corner. 
We started out, I think, doing some of the lower price stuff. And then we went into some $9.99 and $11.99 a gram. This from Broken Coast is at $13.99 a gram. And this is also one of the more unique cultivar corners in that, I'll be honest, when this first arrived, which was now probably four or five weeks ago when all of these various cultivars arrived, I did open it up. I did have a taste of it. But then I put it away and I thought, no, no, we'll, we'll save that for, for probably our last in this series of cultivar corners and pulled it out today. And what that means is that this is now not only a cultivar corner on Gabriola, and we'll talk about that in a sec, but it's also a bit of an examination in what happens with the storage of our cannabis using the packaging that we are given. So in the case of Broken Coast, Gabriola, this is a tiny little black plastic bottle, for lack of a better term. It's opaque, so it should be good. But as we found out last week, plastic does have some interactions with cannabis. And the interesting thing that I'm finding is when I first popped this open, when we first got this and I popped the top, it had a real, real deep smell. Not so much anymore. After having now sat in the same container it arrived in, I sealed it up tight, put it away in a dark closet and just opened it up today. It didn't hold much of the aroma. We'll find out if it still holds all the terpenes that have the effect, but let me give you a description. Gabriola is an indica dominant. Last week, the cultivar we were looking at was a 70-30 split, but it was 70% sativa, 30% indica. And with today's cultivar, we are flipping that right around because Gabriola is a 70% indica, 30% sativa hybrid. So let me give you the description. High THC, indica dominant flower with limonene, caryophylline, linalool, and pinene terpenes that give citrus, pepper, floral, and pine notes. And certainly noted some of those pine notes and some of the citrus. Brightly colored flowers have dense calyx thickly coated with resin. Gabriola has a very robust smell and look. It did when the package was first opened. <laughs> As an indica dominant hybrid, it has complicated genetic history, which is unique to Broken Coast. So as we already mentioned, the price is $13.99 a gram for this. Producer, Broken Coast Cannabis. It is a BC product. It is grown indoor. And once again, it is hand harvested. And the buds looked really beautiful, really, really nicely trimmed. And took a look as well with the magnifying glass. Very, very trichome rich. Uh, all over the place. And again, milky trichomes predominantly is what I was seeing. If we look at the end results, the THC in Gabriola, 0.63% for the buds before decarboxylation. And after that, 19.4% THC. CBD, again, very low in the 0.4% range. The terpenes, we've kind of already identified them, but the three primary terpenes in Gabriola, this 70% indica hybrid, caryophylline 18 to 23%, limonene 22 to 27%, and linalool 11 to 12%, and definitely expected to see the linalool there, the calming terpene, since we are dealing with an indica dominant hybrid. Well, after all that description, let's see what it's like. So once again, to keep things in a common fashion, I have rolled a joint, already pre-rolled the joint, so I don't spend any time boring you with the actual rolling of it. I'm not tasting a whole lot. Again, it could be the fact that it has now been sitting in the cupboard in the bottle, but still tightly closed. Yeah, we'll see if the effect is as strong as it once was. We might have to try this with more strains to see how our cannabis is holding out. Based on the discussion last week on the different containers, I've still got to look and see if I can find some stainless steel ones. That seems to be the best route for me. Now I just got to get enough of them so that I can keep my various cultivars separate because I certainly don't want to be mixing up my indicas and my sativas. And I think you can tell just based on the change in tone and nature of my voice that it is starting to have an impact on me. Mm. And compared to last week's, where again we were a 70% sativa and 30% indica, with the flip around, this is much more of a body stone. Yeah, absolutely. And I like that. <laughs> mm. 
even though it did perhaps not weather the four or five weeks sitting in the cupboard after having been opened, as well as I would like, I'm going to accept a certain amount of that responsibility because we're probably not supposed to be storing our cannabis in the original containers. Those are just meant for delivery, I would think. And now I know that once I have opened something, I'm going to be putting it into a better container. Probably going to be getting some stainless steel ones. And that's where I'll likely be keeping the stash as we go forward. Of course, we don't need to stash it anymore, right? That's one of the stigma things we've gotten rid of. <laughs> yeah, we shall see. That is our look at Gabriola. And it has definitely given me a very nice high. That 70% splits on the Indica high and then the 30% for the Sativa. It's a very nice, very, very nice effect. Again, body is feeling very nicely. Like I'm not ready to go to sleep, but I, but I am definitely ready to relax. And my mind isn't racing. I'm, I'm not speeding with that energy. So there's obviously just a teensy amount of pinene in this. The limonene and the linalool seem to be a little bit more predominant. Another favorite, another good one from my perspective. It was. Even better when it was fresh, but even after hanging on to it for a few weeks, it still has a pretty potent effect. Gabriola from Broken Coast Cannabis. THC, CBD, terpene profiles, what's in me? Oh, please explain to me. Go to the corner, go to the corner, oh yeah. Go to the corner, please explain this stuff to me. Well, since our mind is already on terpenes, why don't we dive further into an examination of terpenes? And as I kind of hinted in the introduction, there might be a touch of perfume involved in this one. Once again, we thank the folks at CannabisNow.com. This is where this particular article comes from. And Kay Astra is the author of this article. Understanding Terpenes Geraniol, a deeper look into the fragrant oils and powerful compounds that boost the heating potentials of cannabis. Diehard fans of fruity or sweety floral scents like berries or roses may not be aware that they have an affinity for a terpene called geraniol that is also found in cannabis and a variety of other plants, herbs, and fruits. As the name suggests, it occurs naturally in geraniums, as well as in roses, lemongrass, peaches, passion fruit, blackberries, blueberries, coriander, nutmeg, bergamot, lemon peels, and even carrots. Bees naturally produce geraniol in their scent-producing glands and use the aroma of it to mark their territories against other colonies. Geraniol is a primary part of rose oil, palmia rose oil, and citronella oil. The aroma and flavor has a range of sweet notes from sugary and rosy to citrus. This taste is often used in different foods as an enhancer and flavoring agent to reproduce the flavor of several fruits and desserts like candies and ice cream, now, the terpene has a variety of medicinal and therapeutic uses as well. It's a natural antioxidant that has anti-cancer and anti-tumor properties that can be useful in treating many different types of cancer. The International Journal of Oncology published a study that provides evidence that geraniol could discourage tumor cell growth in oral, colon, lung, prostate, breast, pancreatic, and liver cancer. Plus, it has antibacterial and antifungal properties that can help reduce infections. In a study published by a medical journal called Lipids, geraniol is shown to be effective in inhibiting the growth of certain types of fungus. Geraniol has also been shown to be antiviral, anti-inflammatory, antispasmodic, and have a lot of potential as a neuroprotectant. A study published by the Journal of Neuroscience Research showed that the terpene can be useful in treating neuropathy, which is common in people with diabetes and people who are pre-diabetic. The condition damages the peripheral nerves and causes numbness, weakness, pain, or loss of sensitivity in the hands and feet. In the experiment, geraniol was able to lower enhanced cystosolic calcium levels and acetylcholinesterase activity, reduce levels of protein carbonyls and nitrates, and restore the activities of enzymes. It is common for strains with high linalool profiles to be also rich in geraniol. A few strains that have geraniol in them include Afghan, a calming hybrid that's good for an euphoric, balanced buzz, Headband, a pain-relieving hybrid that helps with depression, anxiety, and headaches, 
Amnesia Haze, a citrusy sativa strain that's uplifting and energizing. Great White Shark, a heavy-hitting sativa that will reduce stress and improve bad moods. And Sweet Skunk, a potent hybrid that leans more towards a cerebral high. So there is another look at another terpene, which we are all becoming much more <laughs> acclimatized to. Realize that this is not new science, it's just new discovery for those who weren't aware of the science before. Understanding the terpene geraniol. If you want more details, you can check out the link, which is, of course, underneath the episode back on CannabisPodcast.com. From studio high above the clouds of the Okanagan Valley, this is the Cannabis Podcast. Are you feeling a little hungry? After sampling today's cultivar corner, I came down with a real case of the munchies. Yeah, I could go for something nice and sweet now. I want to thank our friends at theokanaganz.com for what we're going to talk about now because this came in their newsletter article today. If you want to get newsletters three times a week about cannabis information, great source of information, especially here in the Okanagan Valley, go to theokanaganz.com and you can sign up and get their newsletter and you can read stories just like this as well. This story is about a guy by the name of Travis Peterson. And Travis Peterson wants to cook a five-course cannabis-infused dessert menu for you. Oh, when I'm sitting here with the munchies, this is a really attractive story. So let me quote some of these story from the OkanaganZ.com. A contestant in the third season of MasterChef Canada, Travis Peterson has been carving a path in the culinary world with private dinners. He's in Kelowna this weekend and then in Toronto on Tuesday, February 26. Details and a discount code you can find at the bottom of the link to the article, and I will post that again underneath the episode on CannabisPodcast.com. To quote Travis Peterson, Cannabis is the new frontier of the culinary world. We're the first country to have full access to be able to cook with this legally. Laws governing edibles are expected this October, and I think yesterday or the day before was your last chance if you wanted to contribute to that. However, according to Travis, any chef can get a product right now that's cannabis-related and be doing research and development in creative things. He says, I've been doing a lot of jobs in the States. I spent a couple of weeks in Asia over the winter, and every chef I talked to has said it's cool what Canada has got the opportunity to do. Feedback on his events include that the cannabis cuisine creates easy conversation, a great night's sleep, and no pesky hangover. And that's something that I don't think we have spent enough time talking about. The fact that there is no hangover, again, for me and most people that I know that consume cannabis, don't have to deal with a horrible hangover in the morning. Ooh, that's just such a horrible thought. So what is Travis doing that is so exciting? Well, he is creating these private dinners that feature a five-course dessert menu. And here is the menu. I'll let you read the article for yourself for all the details. He has partnered up with Starbucks Canada for four events. There's two seatings in Kelowna this Friday and two seatings on Saturday. He'll be serving a five-course cannabis-infused dessert menu at the event called Cake and Bake. <laughs> Perfect. Here's the menu. First course, Captain's Crunch, which is panna cotta, white chocolate Captain Crunch crisp cue, meringue, fresh strawberries, and strawberry gel. Second course, Mission Hill d'Anjou, which is a Merlot braised pear, fresh berries, honeycomb, olive oil cake, vanilla pastry cream. Oh, and of course, forbidden fruit. Forbidden rice, raspberry sorbet, coconut, whipped cream, and mint. I won't give you the other courses. You can check out the link for yourself because it's probably going to make you as hungry and desiring of munchy as I am right now. Maybe this was not the right time for me to read this article. But anyways, a great article, a great idea, cannabis-infused food. We are going to be seeing a ton of that over the next while in Canada, and I'm sure well into the future. So thank you again to theokanaganz.com, and also thank you to Travis Peterson for coming up his, with this great idea. And hopefully he gets lots of participation this weekend in Kelowna and on Tuesday in Toronto. Mm -mm -mm. Sounds pretty good. Now, if you'll pardon me, I'm just going to pull out the vaporizer and a little re-energizing. Before I tell you this next story, which goes back a long, long way, indicative, I suppose, of how long I have been immersed in the cannabis world. 
This is going way back into my teens, late teens. Lived in a town in the BC interior. I was playing in a band, and that particular night we had done a concert at a local, well, I guess you don't call it a concert, do you? You call it a dance <laughs> at one of the local elementary schools. And after that was all done, and I guess, no, it was while that was going on, someone came up to me and asked if they could use my pipe, which I kept in the pocket of my jacket. It was almost like a jean jacket, but it was more of a tartan kind of thing. So they took the pipe out of my jacket. And so as far as I know at that point, I did no longer had a pipe in my jacket pocket. Later on that night, we finished the school dance. The party is happening now in a local park and some buffoon stuck his beer bottle on the top of the car, which let the police know that there was a party going on in the park. Initially, that was not a problem for me. My friend Bob and I came down to the pandemonium as the cops were there trying to break up the party and round everybody up. They checked us out. We were fine, and, and we took off. We got a couple blocks away, and I said, Oh, damn, Bob, I left my jacket back there. Can we go back? There's the vaporizer, by the way, if you didn't hear that. <laughs> Can we please go back? I really need my jacket. So we did. We drove back to the parking lot, and I had friends of mine tell me later, when I hopped out of that car, and I said to the police officer that I just need to get my jacket out of the back of that car. All of the police officers there exchanged one of those knowing glances. And when I reached in, grabbed my jacket out of the back seat, came back out of the car, I then found a hand placed on my shoulder, and I was directed to the back of a police car. Oh boy, oh boy, oh boy. <laughs> the third degree investigation, question after question about this pipe which I, of course, denied ownership of, but they found it in my jacket pocket. Sure, that friend put it back. The only time he ever borrowed it from me and put it back was that night. <laughs> but he did nonetheless. The night ended with me being allowed to go home. No charges or anything, just, you know, we'll be in touch. That same friend got stopped by one of those same officers a couple of weeks later and asked about it. I said, ah, we're not going to proceed with that. It was just a pipe. <laughs> and I sure wish this story ended there. We are now six months later. I was involved in a teen organization. Probably it won't be familiar to you. It was called Teen Town. It was basically like a service club, Kinsman, Lions Club, that kind of thing. But it was teens, and it was called Teen Town. I was mayor of the Teen Town at the time. I am home one afternoon. My parents both worked. I looked after my little brother. A police car pulls into our driveway, which was a very steep driveway, so it was obvious that you could see the police car there. Came to the door and handed me a notice of summons that I was now going to be charged with possession of cannabis resin and gave me an appearance date for court. I couldn't believe it. <laughs> really? So at supper time that night, of course, my parents are now home. My little brother is sitting around there. He says, so why was there a police car in the driveway today? <laughs> I made up some story to my parents that it was a teen town bill that hadn't been paid. And, <laughs> and luckily they bought it. And to finalize this story, I ended up in court. <laughs> and there was my poor mother. I think the first time that she had been in court, maybe not, maybe there was a story she didn't tell me. But the first time she had been in court with one of her children and the judge asked her her birth date. No, she, the judge asked her to give him my birth date. And she literally went through every other child except me. And then I finally had to tell her what my birth date was. <laughs> That's why these laws that have changed, there's been some talk about going back and removing those kind of records, removing all those kind of issues. I certainly hope that it would happen. But there's no reason. I mean, what harm did my having that pipe in my pocket have for anybody. Absolutely none. That was one of the most bogus things that I ever experienced in my life. And now I have shared it with you. And that brings us to a conclusion of episode number 13. And 13s I've never found to be unlucky because my birthday happens to fall only 13. It's never bothered me. So that is episode number 13. Next week, we're going to have to dig up some new cultivars for Cultivar Corner. I don't currently have any, any, any stock. And then we'll dig up all kinds of other fascinating information on the world of cannabis, talking with my friend who her and her husband have 
introduced themselves to cannabis over the last few weeks or few months since legalization has occurred. They've been doing it a very interesting way, and I'm hoping to actually either convince them to come on and talk about it, or they'll give me some more details and I can explain and express some of those details with you. It's really quite fascinating. And I may also be a bud tender the next time we speak. I'll keep you informed with that, too. And that is it for episode 13 of the Cannabis Podcast. From the Cannabis Infused Studio, high above the Okanagan Valley, this was the Cannabis Podcast. Thanks for listening to today's show. To check out more great cannabis podcasts, go to podconnects.com. Here's a preview of one of our other shows. Hey there, my name is Leah Babrudi, and I'm the founder and host of Canna Chicks Podcast, where I discuss cannabis, psychedelics, and other natural medicines. I not only interview people who use them as treatment for different conditions, but also the entrepreneurs who share their knowledge on how they built their businesses. If this sounds interesting to you, give my show a listen. I'm sure you'll learn something that'll surprise you.